Both countries suffered the horrors of war as they were transformed into occupied nations. Even the British expeditionary force in Greece was pushed back into the sea in an action reminiscent of the defeat at Dunkirk. As always, it was the civilian population that paid the price and inherited the scorched earth that remained. The Greek campaign also involved the Italian Air Force. Some of these aircraft were Italian-built JU-87s, part of a batch of 600 made by the Breda Company under license. The normal machine gun complement consisted of two MG-17s and either a single MG-15 or a single MG-81. The two wing-mounted weapons were provided ammunition from wing bays, seen being loaded by the ground crew. The bomb load normally consisted of a single bomb, usually of 550 pounds. Stuka pilots prepare for a mission. Clearly visible on several are the cumbersome flak jackets designed to protect the torso area from ground fire and flak. Italian Air Force JU-87s depart on a mission. They operated with considerable success until, like their Nazi counterparts, they were discovered to be vulnerable to air interception. Concern for the safety of JU-87s in the Italian theater was the result of Operation Sea Lion and the associated failure of the Stuka in the English Channel shipping attacks. In fact, the aircraft had not been a complete disaster. Rather, it had succumbed to the relentless pursuit of hurricanes and spitfires. Prior to the 87, the Italian Air Force didn't possess a modern dive bombing capability. The Stuka served to fill a major gap, particularly in supporting ground troop operations. One of the principal problems was that the ill-trained Italian army lacked the ability to cooperate with aerial forces. And what was worse, communication between German and Italian tactical wings barely existed. By the middle of 1941, the JU-87 should have been undergoing replacement. A much improved twin-engine dive bomber, the Messerschmitt 210 Hornet, had been planned and again personally championed by Ernst Udet. But the 210 was an unmitigated disaster. Not only did it not perform well, but 1,000 were already in production before its failings became apparent. As a result, the 87 was required to soldier on. And even in 1943, when the Germans were starting to produce jet aircraft, no less than 1,000 Stukas left the production line. Completely outdated in design, but nevertheless still able to perform the basic roles. It's a little known fact that Italian forces also played a major role in the most daring exploit of the Second World War, Operation Barbarossa. It was the biggest single gamble that Hitler was to take, and in that it didn't succeed, it was his biggest mistake. Barbarossa was the code name given for the surprise attack against Russian forces. The cause of much speculation, Hitler's real objective of the conflict, the colonization of Russia and the subjugation of the Russian people, would have given him the room to expand that he'd long insisted was Germany's right. No less than 290 German Stukas were employed together with three million men, 600,000 vehicles, and 7,000 guns. By any standard, the figures are staggering. Even though they were confronted by four and a half million Russian combat personnel, the shock and speed of the German Blitzkrieg worked for the last time. The ensuing battle was the largest in history. The Nazis could claim absolute mastery of the skies, and their ground forces proved no less successful during their initial forays. On the first day alone, the Russian Air Force lost no less than 1,800 aircraft against a German attrition figure of 35. No less than 700 aircraft had been destroyed by Stukas.
Although the Luftwaffe also employed other dive bombers, like the twin-engine Ju-88, the fact is most of the early dive bombing work in Barbarossa was carried out by the gull-wing Stuka. A war that Hitler had predicted would be over by Christmas, in fact was to continue for several bloody years. Years that would see the total demise of the Third Reich. For as the wastelands of Russia and its bitter winter had dismissed Napoleon's army, so too would it Hitler's. This dramatic film gives some indication of the deadly firepower of the Stuka. You can see the tracer bullets fired by the aircraft's machine guns seconds before the main bomb is released. This scenario is reenacted thousands upon thousands of times during the course of the Russian campaign. But by now, all the modifications to improve the 87 and keep it competitive with Allied planes were just about exhausted. The Luftwaffe had even resorted to moving the undercarriage spats to reduce weight and provide for better landing in muddy conditions. Now it was apparent that the Ju-87 was simply too old. Accordingly, several attempts to build and produce a state-of-the-art replacement surfaced, not least of which was the modestly successful Henschel HS-129. Though only slightly faster than its predecessor and not nearly as maneuverable, it nevertheless provided superior protection for its pilot and a more diverse weapon capability. Offering the theoretical safety of two engines, in this case a pair of 700 horsepower Gnome Rhone 14 cylinder radials, the HS 129 had a maximum speed of 253 miles an hour. It was equipped with two 7.9 millimeter machine guns, two 20 millimeter and one 30 millimeter cannon, and it could also carry an additional load of four machine guns and up to 550 pounds of bombs. A devastating payload by any standard and a combination that was designed to attack Russian tanks as well as fixed ground positions. The two grooves on the side of the fuselage give an indication of the cannon positions. Initial trials of the type in Russia and North Africa with mixed results had little effect on the Luftwaffe's decision to equip additional units with the HS-129. Operational units formed in Tripoli and Tunis and Sardinia, where only a modicum of service was rendered. These aircraft were moved later to the Eastern Front to confront the massive assemblage of Russian armor. The continuing failure of the HS-129 to show any marked improvement over its vaunted predecessor caused the type to quietly disappear from the Luftwaffe inventory. Yet another contender for the honor of replacing the Ju-87 was a derivative of the somewhat unorthodox, but nevertheless graceful, Focke-Wulf FW-189. Initially unveiled during 1941 as a tactical reconnaissance and army cooperation monoplane, it was referred to as Das Fliegende Auge, or the Flying Eye. With its massive collection of transparencies and its twin boom tail configuration, it was ideal for the assigned task. A total of 828 FW-189s were built by the end of the war, and these saw service on virtually every front. Heavy use of the type occurred in North Africa and on the Eastern Front. Surprisingly, though giving a strong impression of fragility, the FW-189 was a rugged and resilient aircraft. Its usefulness surpassed all expectations, and it proved a difficult target for Allied combatants to counter. This was due in part to its surprising agility, its ability to absorb considerable punishment, and its modestly effective defensive armament. It was even known to survive the notorious Russian Taran, or ramming attack, sometimes returning to base with as much as half its horizontal and vertical tail surfaces missing. By far the most successful of all the Allied ground attack aircraft was the ubiquitous Ilyushin Stomovic. 
It was purpose designed to be a ground attack aircraft of great versatility. It acquired an extraordinary reputation as a tank buster. The Stomovic was respectfully referred to by the Germans as Black Death. And it was revered by the Russians who called it the Flying Tank or the Hunchback. Other Allied air forces also came to realize the strong potential of the heavily armored ground attack aircraft. One of the most successful was the British Hawker Typhoon, a tough and massively armed plane that could also perform well in air-to-air -air combat. In the ground attack role, the Typhoon was deadly, but like the Stomovic, it was no dive bomber. As far as the European theater was concerned, the title of the single-engine land-based dive bomber belongs almost exclusively to the Stuka. It's true, both the British and Americans converted various fighter aircraft to perform similar missions, but none was dedicated in the same way as the 87. As the war approached its inevitable conclusion, hundreds of examples of Ernst Udet's brainchild would be seen wrecked across the nation. The trend of dive bombing had come and gone in a decade. It had been surpassed by Allied improvements to the bomb site. This gave American horizontal bombers greater accuracy, accuracy that would leave the heartland of Germany in ruins and spell the demise of the dive bomber concept. A testament to a totally different form of warfare, adapted from an American idea and pursued with a passion by the resurrected Luftwaffe, but only partly proven in concept, the Stuka dive bomber went on to perform other roles of ground attack and tank buster, simply because there was no other plane available. In the end, it was German long-range planning that failed. But on those on the receiving end of the Stuka's deadly dive, or even those who simply heard the scream of its siren, the 87 left an indelible mark. It was a sound they would never forget.